Hi, this is Marcy Davis with Glasscaster. I am here with Jason Harris, aka Jerome Baker, and we're going to talk a little bit about no, the mystery, the man, the company, and its influence on the functional world. So how are you today, Jason? Wonderful. Thanks so much for having me, Marcy. How did you come up with the name Jerome Baker? Tell me that. Well, I was on a Grateful Dead tour, and we went in blue glass all over the, the country with these guys. And when, when Jerry Garcia finally died... I uh, incorporated the name Jerome. Jerome is Jerry's real name, and Baker is getting baked. And so I felt like uh, using the, a different alias. I didn't have to attach my real name to it. I can make bongs, that, which were highly illegal at the time, and uh, get away with it. Hence, we came up with the name Jerome Baker Designs. That's very cool. When did you start the company then? What year? So I started uh, working in, in glass and art in, in 91 when I, I, I had gone to a two-year school in Massachusetts and did basically printmaking and fabric arts. I did a lot of batiks and tie-dye and, and, and lithograph and all this process-oriented art. And when I ended up in Eugene, Oregon, I met Bob Snodgrass, and that was in 1991, and uh, started working in glass ever since then. You know, I, at the at the time when I was when I started Glass, I was an art major at the University of Oregon, so it was a really interesting you know process to me is looking at this guy making the glass blowing, and my my instant thought was how do I incorporate this into what I'm doing? Talk about being in the right place at the right time. How many people did you start out with, and when the company was formed? Well, in the beginning, uh, I met the old man, Bob, and, and sh he showed me a little bit how to make glass, and I needed to go get a torch. That was my next move, and f the only place I knew to get enough money for a torch was to go to Alaska. So I went up to Alaska, and I worked for the summertime, and you know, just got the got the, the, the money I needed to come back down and buy my first torch, which I did, and I started working alongside a guy named Chris Shave. And Chris and I uh, started blowing glass together in a garage during the during the nights, and then we'd go sit over at Bob's house during the days and watch him work, so we can get insp inspiration. Um, right around that time, uh, there was there was nobody else really making the making glass pipes. It was just us. Uh, there was Hugh Glass. And there was a couple of others, a guy named Tori doing uh, spoons and stuff like this. So it was really early on, and I was blessed enough to be part of that original Snodgrass clan. Wow. And what were the limits as far as color back then? In the early days when we were doing the flame working, it, 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 nobody really knew anything other than a uh, national hand torch with a three number three hole tip so we'd, we would we would C clamp the hand torch to the bench and off we went and if you were using you know 30 millimeter uh, standard wall tubing you were a big boy uh, so back 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 then you know people would just pile clear on top of uh, color on top of clear on top of fumes and then try and then the challenge was to melt it all in and then and then see if we could see you know in there after you smoke out of it what we drew in there were the words that we wrote the uh -huh. early colors were were from paul troutman at north star and we had a uh you know a ruby red we had a cobalt blue we had a caramel and we had a um, uh, amber purple. And how about Blue Moon? That's always been one of my favorite colors. Absolutely not. Are you kidding me? Blue Moon didn't come out until you know we were well deep into this thing. Anything with the two two word names and colors are all brand, are all new. <laughs> so in the beginning, you know, it was Paul who came up with those original uh, reds and blues and caramels that we that we needed to kind of get that palette expanded. Mm-hmm. So show us a couple of the early works and offerings of the company. We got all these good images here. So yeah. So so just to kind of back it up, before I did start Jerome Baker, I I learned how to make glass, and so that came with making whatever I could, Chillum's pipes, 
uh, anything that I could, and I would take it out on the road and um, and and sell it. And most of the time, we were at Grateful Dead or Jerry Garcia shows. It was just where the they had an f- instant flea market that would set up on the street, and there was over 80, 80, 80 gigs a year uh, going on with Grateful Dead. So we just had an opportunity to sell it. All, everything was a perfect storm there. So so it offered that unique place to sell pipes for for good money. And they, so, didn't, they didn't go after you. I mean, you like that nobody nobody cared that you were selling pipes at the gigs. Like it was all kind of a hands off approach from the when, law. When we were when we were doing that, it was only Chris Shave and I. So it's two people amongst thirty thousand. We learned how to stay in the cracks, and we didn't really draw much attention like that to ourselves. Uh, wow. We we were totally connected with the band though, and totally connected with the light light crew. So we would just trade pipes every night for passes, and so that's how we got in the shows. So either way, it was it was not until uh, probably 90, 92, 93, 93 maybe that we actually started making bongs out of the Boris silica glass. At the time, again, I was telling you that that we only knew about national hand torches. So it took a larger burner to kind of create what you're seeing here, and that's when the Carlisle came. I'll give you the quick story. Uh, Dan Kay showed up from uh, Salem Community College with a Carlisle that nobody had ever seen before, and that changed the game. That's when we saw the first bubbler come out and the first larger scale borosilicate work was coming out of uh, the, the Pacific Northwest. Eugene, Oregon, to be specific, was the hub of this whole Piper movement. So here we're going to look at a, a couple of pieces that I've done through the years, and these are very early pieces. You see no top work is done on the on the bong. It's just got a fume top up there. The double ball looks kind of like a woman's hips. It's sexy. It smokes really well. Um, it's got a, a, a grommeted uh, jo- a sleeve there and a grommeted a bowl. So this is another piece in that same genre, in that same manner. You can see the fuming work on there. The fuming acts like a mirror without a background. As you use it more and more, it appears to change color. And these little designs and, and details that we put in there kind of appear the more you use it. Here's a single ball bong that kind of represents that UFO shape on the bottom. Uh, that's standard, uh, old school, straight up bong. And that's got that's modeled after the old graphics uh, that we used to use as kids. So we hold the water in there, and we get the perfect little snapper hit on these pieces. But you can see the how primitive the top work is. It's a little flared out. Uh, there's only a little bit of spin trail on there. Uh, it's just it's 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 a different piece nowadays. So these are great uh, examples of some of the early work. And let's let's all remember that after I got arrested, all my computers were confiscated. So any pictures, any digital images that I had since before 2003 were destroyed with the police evidence. And any work that I had in the shop was all destroyed. So you, you, we started out again with nothing after 2003. So these pictures represent a lot of that kind of stuff. I love as that we, piece. As we scaled the company up, um, I, I, I incorporated in 1995 – and uh, my partner, Jordan Schefter, we started the, 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 the company in college together. Um, so in the early days, it was me making the glass, and Jordan would get in the car and run the glass out to the stores and collect the checks and keep this whole thing alive. Uh, we, we had to work and deal with many characters along the way. Uh, yeah. But we've been doing this whole thing since ni- the 1991 years. So it's it's a long you know road that we've traveled. Um and this this particular piece represents one of the first motherships that we've ever made. And when we talk about a mothership, we, we did a certain amount of the single bong that you saw initially. And then after we started to progress, we added more and more skews to the line. This was uh, represented the higher end at the time. This is probably 1993. Uh, this piece was made. And it's just, again, represents those early years. You see the spin trail. Uh, that was a big move for us, to spin trail all that glass onto the tubing as it was circled around the lathe. Then you see the marbles on the back. The marbles on the back were just planted 12 mil rod. And I could plant that 12 mil rod into those spin trails and give them a twist and get a little psychedelic effect on those marbles. It made it real nice, kind of draw the, drew the bong up, out, up into the, the marbles. You see the real big bowl out on the front of that thing. Um, so people really enjoyed, you know, having these unique, um, really fancy bowls and and wiping them out clean. It, it all is in the, the old Bob Snodgrass fumed glass style. 
and those bowls do represent that real color changing stuff out on the front that's where the most resins are going to build up on the piece as we go more and more skews in the line uh, we tried different things uh, some of the old boys that smoked a lot of the hash back in the day would like using a, a, a they would put a, a soda can or a mason jar and they would have a bowl hanging out of that with a hose hanging out of the side of it and it gave a great hit so we decided to make these little cup hookahs they fit in the cup holders it's a great little piece and um, I'm, I'm hoping to start making these again soon I just need manpower uh, the the old shop we had uh, over 70 employees at our peak and um, we were able to kind of create unique new designs do R&D because we had all that extra manpower out of those 70 people 40 of them were glass workers the rest were admin and office workers shipping receiving blah 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 Wow so I'm gonna scroll on to the next piece the the hookahs got more elaborate and uh, the hookahs are a lot of fun for me to make I rarely see them anymore from the old days whether they've been destroyed or whether we just didn't make a lot there's just not a lot of them around we've taken this concept now and we've made uh, new large-scale hookahs that have quartz bowls on them we're able to bring them out to events and share the hookah for for me is an incredible shape it offers a community experience with smoking cannabis and you're able to talk to each other and have some fun with it and regulate each other how hard you're sucking or who's who's pulling and when or it's just fun it's for me it's a more fun way to explore the cannabis here's some of the early on bubblers and these are probably when we first started going uh, and, the, and I didn't know the doer seal and nor did a lot of people in Eugene it wasn't like everybody was dropping bowls into these bubblers this is what, what I what I called the Hopkins oh no this isn't even a Hopkins seal this is just a, a bowl with a joint or a bowl with a, a, a rubber grommet a hole in the top of the bubbler uh, this is the awesome hit though this is this is the best way uh, to really hit you know good hash or good quality keef it's just a great great way to, to enjoy the smoke and so again these represent some of those early bubblers where there was actually absolutely no seals involved it was a hole in the top and a, and a joint or a, a grommet and I'm, I'm kind of giggling looking at that one on the left seeing how off and wonky it is uh, but again primitive this slide captures on the left the uh, the same pieces that we saw before and then off to the right we have a, um, a regular doer seal bubbler it's a it's a the the newer way or 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 the most updated way that that I would I would consider making the the bubblers now. What did something like this sell for at the time? Okay, so the the the, the bubbler was the, like the most the most hard piece to make because again we're using this little wanky equipment and shit would crack all the time. So we would so reality is 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 back in the day we would sell a pipe for fifty bucks, a bubbler hundred and twenty five. A nice mm -hmm. chillum, maybe sixty bucks. These that was the the, the prices of of the, you know the, the the average prices of when we very first started. Once things got good, okay, and there was nobody else in the game, we were Chris and I were getting flown out to New York by these young hippies. They would bring us to the apartment and put the pipes right up on the scale and pay us ten bucks a gram. And so at wow. that point, that gave us incentive to go put big marbles, make these things out of heavier glass, gather more glass, whatever we had to do to make it heavier, right? Yeah, smart move. So at that point, that, that was before the, the Carlisle and the Bethlehem and everything, everybody had discovered this stuff. You got to understand, that was all scientific guys and, and, and guys that just had, had a different kind of a knowledge in America. Maybe the guys in Disneyland or Disney World or whatever, but you know, it, was, it took Salem Community College to, to get the, the Piper movement ignited with the good equipment. That's my opinion. Got it. So, uh, you know, just some more of the skews, the different pieces that we did back in the day, uh, how they looked, how they stood up to each other, it started to develop a line. By the end of my, uh, by the time I got arrested, I should say, we had 19 pieces, regular skews in the line, and then out of those 19 uh, different pieces, there would be little offs here and offs there. You know, when you're making a, a glass to try to replicate it piece by piece, sometimes you get, uh, get a little, little idiosyncrasy happening here or there and so we'd have to sell those pieces as seconds or just what we call odds 
So again, you know, we had 19 pieces in the end. This is part of the first, very first skews here. So you can you can see, you know, this is a very primitive look. Adding in some more, lots of marbles. We would do dots on dots, or dots under dots, or dots next to dots, or big <laughs> dots next to little dots. <laughs> dots were fun, okay? And and it created an optic that looked so cool when you were doing it. And you know, the the part of the magic of the glass blowing was being able to make this piece and then have this beautiful object at the end and say, oh, I did that myself. So it's rewarding. And these dots, these fumes are everything I learned from Bob Snodgrass. Wow. Hey, when you were at the height of production, how many pieces would be produced in a day? Well, that's a great question, but it's loaded because reality is with 19 different SKUs, uh, similar to you may, maybe you go to the Ford factory and they only make a couple of the, uh, the awesome Mustangs, but they make a whole bunch of the Ford Focuses. So right. as similar with Jerome Baker, we have a few different pieces in the line. If we produce a, one of our small pieces with the right crew back in the day, I could do over 300 bongs in a day. If we produced our large pieces, we could potentially do four pieces in a day, and they all might crack because the glass is so thick or whatever the, the problems were. So it just varied greatly. It's about, it's about being a good coach and having a good team and being able to understand what's coming down the pike, what's going to be getting sold next week, uh, and what we need to fill orders. And then we, we kind of gear it towards that. The slide you're seeing right now represents when we started drawing and sculpting on the bongs. So it became a different paradigm, as you asked before, the colors. By this time in the, in the game, the color had went from our basic seven colors to start with from Troutman, uh, and we might have had over a thousand to choose from by this time between Mumka, Cub Glass Alchemy, uh, Paul Troutman, North Star, and whatever other sideshow was going on at the time. So uh, here you got some whites and some blues, things that we didn't have access to in the past that looked really good now. So we we're able to kind of bring the pieces to life more. Mm -hmm. uh, different technique that we use, you know, a lot. That piece on the left is, is, is very simple to make. You would draw three circles in three different color stringers. One outside of the next, similar to you'd see a target. Then we're taking a tungsten pick and we're dragging it like a pie in. We're dragging it from the outer rim in and then from the inner rim out. And it creates that quick flower. Slam it in the middle with a 12 mil rod and you got a marble over the middle of that flower and it looks psychedelic. It's very quick, very easy to do. Most of the designs that you see on the pieces today are developed from a production is being able to take a 12 mil rod and lay it down and it does a certain thing. The piece on the right is the same thing. It's a twisted cane that he's made dots with right down the left side. And then he makes dots across the bottom. And then basically you would you take a 12 mil rod and put it in frit and then put it on the bong. And so there we have a very quick, very you know fast made piece but it's very detailed uh, you know the in the end game it's about to get the user to look at it for eons to be able to sit down with the piece and look into the marbles and get to know it name it you know they become emotionally attached to these bongs so we want to put as much into it as we can at the same time we want to be able to make them efficiently so we can give them to the people at a good price Again, drawing into the glass now. And now we have that piece of glass on a lathe and melt that drawing into the, into the tubing. So you can see some of those dots are melted in. And then this was uh, made by a woman, Piper Brett, uh, a very successful artist now. And she was a part of the lathe team. And she you know, has taken the dots and put them into the fumes, got them melted in, and then stopped the lathe and then drawn more over those back dots. So it becomes... Uh, so detailed and so layered that as the piece gets used, again, more and more come out, uh, more and more different little designs and shapes. Now we've got branding going on, starting with the previous bong and on into these logos. Is there a specific um, application or period of time that these different logos were used? I designed the logo, I think, in uh, probably 96 
Uh-huh. It was probably 1995 that, 1995 that I designed the logo. I had a stepfather that was in the Air Force, and we had that big Air Force symbol all over all our surfboards when we were kids. It's that circle with the flags on either side of it, um, and, and it has the star. It's the Air Force symbol. I wanted something like that that had that kind of an Air Force or board shape behind it with the, with, the, with the letters that have arrows, one pointing one way, one the other way. It kind of – it kind of – takes up space and and lays itself into position is how I thought of it. Also, Jerry Garcia Band was one of my favorite acts. That's JGB. Uh, I felt like if we had three letters, it kind of has a nice ring to it. Um, and again, you know, we named it Jerome Baker, uh, so I had an alias. So the, the, the letters JBD worked well. Put in the ink, we, we got it incorporated in 95. That seemed to make it a little more um, official to me, okay? Right. Uh, we, we there's only one logo for us. We've done many incarnations of the logo in terms of what do we color it or how do we use it in the artwork that we're doing. So over the years, you'll see the thing come up in all different uh, colors and variations. But there's a standard JBD, and it's uh, it's modeled in a in a in a 1990s graffiti or 80s graffiti style. Uh-huh. We've had a lot of friends okay. through the years that have owned stores. Uh, a lot of stores uh, carry the pieces heavy. This is one example. This is down in Gainesville, Florida, a store named High Tides. And it's an old friend of our, Curtis. And he, you know, a big supporter through the years. When I was arrested, he was one of the guys that, that took care of us and made sure that we got through uh, the arrest and the, the hard times. During our ten- my tenure with Jerome Baker and Eugene, uh, I had gone to Pilchuck Glass School. And Pilchuck Glass School was a life-changing experience, showing me different masters from around the world come teach the trade and the art of glass blowing. I wanted that in Eugene, and I felt like we had the, the momentum in Eugene. We had the amount of glass blowers. By the time 19, you know, 97, 98 rolled around, there's a lot of glass blowers in Eugene. So I felt that I should use some of the money from Jerome Baker to create a nonprofit. Which we did, and it was called the Eugene Glass School. And uh, Saeed Matadi, Hans Ittig, uh, John Wiedemann, George Kerr, and and I myself uh, started this incredible venture, which is still alive today and still creating uh, unique and inspired glass artists that will infect our world greatly. So this picture is, is before we actually moved into the glass school. This is right when we got the building and we had the Germans there and we were ready to attack. Hans and Hans and Carl Ittig, father and son team, were instrumental in making sure that we had an incredible glass school with incredible equipment and all that. This is one of the benches at the old Jerome Baker shop. You can see that giant Carlisle sitting next to the piece. Bench kilns, masses, stuff everywhere, guys fighting. Uh, you know, sleeping with each other's wives. I mean, anything you can imagine happen. It's like it's like having a band with seventy people in the band. So uh, that was that was part of the whole drama at the old Jerome Baker shop. You see some of the two. These are two motherships sitting in front of the Carlisle torch. Uh, nice hood over the top of that bench. We were the first ones to come out with the octagonal bench. Uh, that's so all the blowers look at each other and communicate, share ideas, share inspiration. Those benches were now taken into the Carlisle Machine Works, and uh, they use that same design. It's gone gone global. Uh, proud to say we were the first ones to come up with that and design that one. I've always admired that. I didn't know that was your design. I've, I've been at their, you know, I filmed at their glass school there, and I, uh, I really, I loved it. I thought it was perfect. So, yeah. There you go. Thank you. Another picture of one of the bubblers. The bubble. These bubblers kind of changed the game. You're able to add water to your smoke now, and instead of smoking a dry pipe, really get the flavor and really get the the clean the clean hits. More and more sculpture evolved. This lizard represents again a few swipes with the 12 mil rod. So if you if you if you hit that thing right and you heat the rod up and you lay it down, you have the lizard's body in one quick second. And then you put down uh, the color rods over the top of it. You get the tail, the, the legs, and then just grab those. Or the, the, the feet are done with stringers, just, just dragging stringers right off the leg. Super simple. Very quick, but very uh, it works well, and it looks incredible in the end. Again, all developed with the, with the Jerome Baker production. See giant marbles here. I would have a small glory hole. Some days I would take that small glory hole, and I would have a huge... 
a 30 mil rod in my hand and just heat the end of the rod. And I would run it out to people that needed that rod or that rod to sculpt on the back of the bong at that minute. So I'd run the rod out They'd with their diamond shears, clip a bit, a bit off of my rod. Now they'd have a big wad of glass on the back of their bong and I'd be back at the glory hole heating the rod to give to someone else. High uh, uh, intensity, high velocity glass, uh, flame working. As, as fast and hard as you can go. And they're putting these blobs onto seven and nine mil pieces. Here you see a lot of the fuming work, some of the different designs. The sunshine has always been a staple. Again, a 12 mil frit marble, boom, right there, one time. Heat, heat up the marble, hit the frit, slam it on the back of the bong, grab your color rod and make your rays. You're done. I love this. Again, you're going to look at the, the detailed work in the, um, in, the, in the tubing and how she's probably worked long and hard on the, on the lathe on this thing. And then in the end, hand it off to me and I could come with a, just a 12 mil rod and get some serious optics to pop out from underneath it. And then there you have your, your awesome you know, psychedelic bong that's, that's very valuable. And then we look off the front of it. One of the key players at the Jerome Baker shop was Dave Strobel, who made these incredible aqua themed slides and uh the bowl alone here is at least a thousand dollar bowl these days and even back then that was a three hundred dollar bowl uh no breaks so it it, it, it the, the the work sells you can put the put the work into these pieces and it'll sell you know i'm just a production guy that believes in you know look we're going to do a, a majority of of pieces that we can get into the masses things that will sell for under two hundred dollars and then we put some energy and time into these masterpieces and the masterpieces really show the technique and the level of craftsmanship that go into this i mean you look on the piece uh, on the body of the bong on the left you can see the the, the, the intense detail in the just the sweat this is swiping and and smearing where on the right intense detail in fish millies and frit laden reef scene underneath the thing um that whole bowl is is done on a flat piece of glass and then rolled up to be what it, what you see there <clears throat> we did a lot of sculpture and, and again every sculpture that's ba that's on these bongs is developed from production again you have a big fat butterscotch marble on the top of this skull at the left here that's one butterscotch marble and then we drill it in with the probably the back of some tool to make those eyes real quick heat it and drill it in the bottom i'm going to take that butterscotch i'm going to swipe it down and around to create the look of an open jaw this happens really quickly snip those teeth right out of the butterscotch put them in with a little butter knife and i have my skull on the left on the right you see the same kind of a technique it's using a big marble big hitted marble and then a couple of more swipes and it creates this skull everything's based on that production so we can get them done and get them out you don't want to be hanging on to this thing for too long anyway you got it in your hand it's heavy it's hot and 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 the whole time uh you know they have the butt keeps puckering more and more like it wants to blow you know what i mean you you have to have your your you have to get it done in, in the right time tell me so, about this some of the old old pieces that I did were um, extreme and and when I and, I'm, and large bubblers. This was one of the famous sidecar nug jar bubblers, and so it's just you know something that was fun for me at the time and and really showy. Uh, when when you make these giant pieces, we can bring them out to the dead shows, and you're the man walking around with this thing. I mean, this is the ultimate you know uh, peace pipe. Everybody wants to pack it with their chronic weed and hash. And, uh, you know, if you can sneak it in the show, which we would always do, uh, you'd be passing this thing around and everybody thinks they're a king sitting up there watching the music. So, uh, you know, th this is the one, man. These, these are the ones. I'm actually out here making two of these right now. I got a big demo tomorrow, and I'll piece together a, a regular hammer bubber, bubbler. Um, but but this, is, I, this is what I enjoy doing. This is a lot of fun for me and, and a way to make a show out of a, out of a flame, flame, uh, flame working demo, you know. A, a lot of the times making a demo, I, I look at these guys, it's like watching paint dry. It takes so long and so tedious, and I can't even see what they're doing. So for me, this is my answer. Answer. You know what I mean? Let's go go big. Let's make something fun that everybody's kind of like in suspense by the end of this thing, and you get a climax out of it. You know that that that's what it's all about. Right. I, it's a really a shame how people have forgotten in their demos to do things that are for the show, 
that aren't tiny and time consuming. Doesn't make any and sense. Doesn't make any yeah. sense. I could go home and watch this, you know, uh, 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 on on a, on, a, on a microscope. It just doesn't even make sense sometimes. So yeah, I yeah. think that uh, we have to remember that glass blowing is part show, and um, it's been like that since the the ancient times. So um, this is my answer to that. And yeah, I appreciate you guys having me on this incredible forum to share my knowledge and experience. I'm not done with you yet. I want to know how many people do you think started blowing glass because of Jerome Baker designs? You know, uh, we I, I run into people all the time that have told me that their their friend worked at Jerome Baker and taught them how to make glass. Or I run into uh, old blowers from the, the old shop who have now had successful glass blowing businesses. So there's there's literally hundreds of glass artists out there that were infected by our shop in one way, shape, or form. And so what are some of the names that we might still recognize that came out of the shop? You know, there's a lot there's a lot of really cool um, companies and pieces that, that happen right now, uh, from Dave Strobel to Golden Gate Glass to Heavy Glass um, to, you know, you have Dave Popowitz. Uh, gosh, there's so many. Uh, Mente One. We have Big Tom Glass. You have... Um, uh, Jen Lippet glass. Um, you have Mike Plain came out of our our scene down there. You know he came to the town, and we had a uh, a lot, Everybody. A, lot, a, like lot. a lot. We had a lot of early 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 risers in there, and it was a lot of fun. And 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 it's fun to kind of see what's happened now with the whole scene. So, are there any uh, ripoff stories you would like to share? You know, through through the years dealing in this business, it's not just normal business people. It's it's all kinds that come in and out, and I've seen all types of stuff happen. And um, you know, I, I want everybody has, should be aware. You know, you you need to write things down of agreements. You need to understand who you're working with and understand who you're going to give terms to. So you know. Just, just being careful and and, a, and having a sense of business is very important. I always say, ninety nine percent of being a good artist is being a good salesman. Um, so understand who you're dealing with. You're probably really good at that. So I want to know if you've got a good story about a broken piece or maybe a confiscated piece. Yeah. Well, what we have is I, I've I've ran contests through the years that say. Uh, if you give me a give me you know tell me about your bong or send me a picture of you and your bong I'll give you a t-shirt and so I have hundreds of stories in a big bound notebook that says testimonials and it is it's filled with stories of of people this is this is even before I got arrested this is people who have lost their bongs or their mom took their bong or the cop took the bong and tried to break it and it didn't break and some of the funniest things ever so at some point uh, we're going to do a, a coffee table book and we're going to include the testimonials in this coffee table book and if you have a good story come to my Instagram and share it with us or Facebook and find me and I will send you a little swag for your good story and uh, what's the most successful piece that you've made through your career? You know, we I've done a, a, a lot of really, I, I would consider them legacy pieces. Uh, recently, we did the world's largest bong at 24 feet. Uh, that, that's been on display down on Fremont Street in Las Vegas. Uh, I've made probably 45 just super giant bongs with the Chihuly crew and with all the my favorite glass blowers from Seattle. And um, and you know, I just just countless. I did the Register Guard Building in Eugene, Oregon uh, install. Uh, just countless things that we've done. My favorite piece that I've done, or my mo or my, my my most successful piece, was the piece that we got to make for the Dalai Lama himself, and we got to go give it to him and present it to him and have that whole experience of you know his holiness. And so for me, that was the, the most important piece that I've done through the years. Wow, no kidding. Yeah. Well, I guess that that's that's as good as it gets. So I think uh, yeah, we can definitely. end on a happy note. If people want to know more about the company, they can go to JeromeBaker.com. And thank you for your time. It's been most enlightening. Excellent. Oh, and this is Marcy Davis with Glasscaster. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.